Hello and welcome to GMBN Tech Ask, the show where you use hashtag AskGMBN Tech down in the comments of any of our videos and either myself or Doddy will try and come up with an answer in a show like this. So let's jump straight in. I've got a question from Lord Chewington who says, does the amount of hub engagement points affect pedal kickback? Uh, yes, only if your bike is prone to it and only in certain conditions. So let's explain engagement. That is obviously you putting pressure on a crank and then pulling the chain which pulls the cassette and engages the hub. Now with a full suspension bike, often when you sink into the suspension, your bottom bracket and your rear axle path your rear axle will move slightly further away from each other. It'll lengthen that chainstay length and it will cause what we refer to as chain growth. It will pull on that chain, which will pull on the cranks and give you that feeling of the pedals kicking back. So that's pedal kickback. Now, if you have a high engagement hub, then it'll effectively engage sooner and give you that feeling sooner. So if we look at those two extremes, if you had a hub that was infinite engagements, it's always, always engaged, then as soon as the bottom bracket and the rear axle move away from each other, as soon as you get that chain stay lengthen and the chain growth, then you will get pedal kickback. If on the other end of the scale, you had a hub that had no engagement whatsoever, it never engages, then it would freely be able to move clockwise or move forward and it will never pull the chain It'll, as the two points move away from each other and it will never give you that feeling of pedal kickback. Now, the problem with pedal kickback um, as I've described, this scenario only works when that rear wheel is completely static, effectively. Say you hucked a flat, just landed dead, and both those points moved far away, and you have that chain growth, then you would definitely feel a pedal kickback. But if you were descending, and you're experiencing that chainstay lengthen as the suspension moves. If the wheel is moving forward, which it usually is, then it should be able to allow for some slack as you put pressure on the pedals and you allow the cassette to move forward and you therefore allow the hub to move forward and to rotate clockwise. So you wouldn't necessarily feel pedal kickback in that situation. Now, if, for example, you were to lock up your back wheel, say you're dragging your back brake down a descent, then it would lock everything up. And if your bike experiences um, chain growth, then it could, in theory, then create that lock up in the drivetrain and then pull your cranks. Uh, or it might just your pressure and your body weight on the pedals might cause the drivetrain to lock up and then completely lock up your suspension. So it might not actually give you pedal kickback, but it might actually stop your suspension from working properly in that situation when you're dragging your back brake. Um, so not all bikes experience it. Um, and suspension, rear suspension designs differ in terms of their chain growth. Um, so some bikes may feel it more than others. If you have a bike that feels uh, that pedal kickback, um, you're probably only gonna get that sort of situation in certain circumstances, like hucking to flat and stopping dead, and like descending with your back brake locked up. So I would say, Yes, hub engagement does in theory um, have an effect on pedal kickback, but you can kind of um, get around that if you needed to. And a hub with less engagement, a little bit of free uh, forward movement or clockwise movement may counter pedal kickback. But again, it's only ever present in certain situations anyway. <sighs> we could debate that all day, but let's move on to uh, Will Hind 94, who says uh, thick tire and no insert or light tire with insert for enduro riding. 
good debate. Okay, so I've used Vittoria just as an example here. Uh, Vittoria Mazza is 950 grams for a 2.4 29er. Um, or 1300 grams for their two ply, which is what I consider their thicker uh, enduro tire. So that is an added 350 grams on each tire uh, if you have that 2.4 29er setup. So that's 700 grams added from a trail to an enduro uh, casing tire. Now, if you had the trail tire and you added an insert instead, the insert for a 2.4 medium is 150 grams so that's a total of 300 grams so if weight is of a concern to you then you would save weight you would save 400 grams by going for a trail tire um, and an insert than if you were to go for an enduro tire um, and no insert i would say it depends what you're riding um, I get away with trail tires um, and especially in the UK when things are sort of dirt based, it's usually muddy and rooty uh, and I don't tend to worry too much about needing thicker sidewalls from something like the two ply enduro tire. However, if you're riding somewhere that's quite rocky and you are quite prone to those sidewall splits, I would go for the two ply uh, enduro style tire. Um, personally, if I go racing abroad, somewhere like Spain, where it's really, really rocky, somewhere like Whistler or Squamish, where I'm hitting things fast and I'm prone to sidewall splits, then I would go for both. I mean, why not? You're only adding 300 grams uh, and 700 for the, the tire. So in comparison to a trail tire only and a enduro casing tire with an insert as well, you're adding a kilo to your bike. Um, so you just wanna think, is that kilo gonna put you off uh, riding rather than just having something that's a safe setup? Um, so Cayenne Raymond, uh, says, why can't companies just make hubs with a higher point of engagement? Uh, can't you just put a bigger drive ring into the hub? Okay, so as we have discussed in the first question, um, higher points of engagement isn't everything. It's not for everyone. Um, and also, when you make a hub with high points of engagement, uh, there's more teeth that are a lot smaller, if you think. Um, so they then become a little bit more complicated to make, so they're more expensive to make, uh, and they can potentially be more delicate. So I would say, um, not everyone does it because people want choice. There are some riders out there that would prefer to have a more robust hub that is more cost effective rather than a high point of engagement that has smaller teeth that could potentially be more delicate and more expensive. And if they're trying to counteract some pedal kickback, then they might want a low point of engagement anyway. Uh, so Milo T67 says, why is the weight difference not that high between aluminium versus carbon? I wish I'd have carbon wheels for the energy it seems to transfer, but I can't make up my mind and pay 2K for a very similar weight. Uh, if at least this amount would help shed off uh, a few hundred grams. Um, I think it's a common misconception that carbon is lighter, that you would buy carbon wheels uh, to get lighter wheels. That's not necessarily the case. I've always found that some of the lightest wheels on the market uh, are aluminium. Um, you would switch to carbon wheels if you wanted that any energy transfer, as you mentioned. Um, certainly in trail and XC, when you push into a corner fast, if you've ridden carbon wheels and you come back to aluminium, which I've done before, you do actually feel that sort of flex in the wheels and it can either be slightly disconcerting or it can sort of give you a bit of a delay before you uh, pull out of the corner. Um, so I get why people would want carbon, um, but often it's not that they're lighter, um, more that you can get more strength for the same weight as aluminium wheels. 
Um, it's up to you whether you think that £2,000 is uh, worthy of having the same weight uh, for the same for a better energy transfer or for stiffer wheels. Um, so if you're in the world of XC and weight is only of a concern, then forget the material. Uh, if you're currently on some wheels at the moment and you don't feel any flex and you don't feel um, hampered in power or performance by your existing aluminium wheels, then just get a lighter set of aluminium wheels. Um, you're talking about saving a couple of hundred grams. Um, I would say for £2,000, you could save so many more hundreds of grams elsewhere. I mean, for £2,000, you could possibly buy a whole new frame, which might save you more than 200 grams. So um, I would say look at other things first and think about whether carbon is actually going to be of a benefit to you. Uh, so Rose Ambrosi uh, or Rose Mabrosi says, what are the advantages of building wheels in two cross, three cross and four cross? Um, so that's referring to whether the spokes cross over in a lacing pattern. So the zero cross would be a radial spokes and it would literally just be a direct line from the hub to the rim. Uh, two cross would be that the spoke will cross another spoke at some stage in its lacing pattern. Um, and this is just basically like structural um, rigidity it's it's more strength by crossing them uh sort of think about it like a basket weave um there if there's more points um to um cross then there's more strength it, it's why often you get um a three cross on the drive side of a rear wheel because it requires that strength to uh, pull the rim round and get that rotation. Um, so the advantages are literally that, just increasing in strength as you increase the amount of crosses. Um, the Candy Flick, <laughs> oh, the Scandy Flick, obviously. Um, how to pick tire compound, compound casing, tread, and win width for winter. That was a mouthful. Um, or does it matter anyway? Well, it's funny you should ask that because literally the other week, uh, me and Doddy did a winter tire video um, where Doddy was on dry mixed terrain and I was on a sort of mud uh, wet tire. Um, and we compared the two and it completely depends. It depends on what you're riding. Um, on the day, my tires were great in the mud because that's what they're designed for. Um, Dot is not so much, uh, but his were still great in the trail centers where things were pretty fast rolling anyway. Um, and neither of them would be great if it was super soft snow. Uh, so winter is such a generic term. I think you need to think about what terrain you're riding on. What are the conditions? Is it wet? Is it muddy? Is it snowy? Think about those things and find that tire for you because your winter might be very different to my winter. Um, and finally here from Callan Thompson Sound, I would love to see a visual comparison between 2.4, uh, 2.5 tires on various width rims to see how this affects the profile of the contact area. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna demonstrate some extremes on this so that you can get an idea because I, I can't list out all the differences of rim widths um, and tires. Their profiles are all going to be different depending on different brands. Um, so I'm going to show you the extremes so that you get a kind of a visual. If you would have a really wide rim and a not so wide tire, uh, then you would get this kind of squared off um, profile if you will and that would make the cornering a little bit weird vague and just generally the profile is not how it's supposed to be and it won't work as best it can 
Now, the counter is having a really narrow rim profile. I mean, I've gone to the extreme here, and it, but if you had a tire that's too wide for a narrow profile, then you get this kind of curve, which is not a bad profile. Uh, you'd think that cornering would be great in it, but you then get this instability in the tire and you will actually feel it deform. So you kind of want to get a balance. Um, and I know I've not completely answered your question, but hopefully seeing the different extremes will sort of give you an idea of why it's important to make sure you have the width of tire that your rim suggests it should be on, or look at your tire and see what width of rim that it is recommending to be on as well. Um, but I think I might do this video in more detail in the future because it's actually a really good question. Um, but for now, um, I will say goodbye. And if you have any burning questions, then don't forget to use hashtag AskGMBNTech down in the comments, and I'll try and answer your question in the future. Thank you.